Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 6. We are reading from verse 12 through to verse 20. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the, hop, for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a the prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. This is the word of God. What a passage. Before we hear the word of God, I want to just uh, pray. I want you to do this separately because it's just too much to incorporate in one prayer. But just pray for Liz. For those of you uh, who weren't here in the morning service, um, we commissioned Liz Henkel as the women's worker in the church, and we prayed for her in that commissioning service at the 8.30 service. But we did also want to just uh, pray for her again in our evening service and our 10.30 service. So I want to do that and now before we come to the preaching of the word of God and uh, just commit Liz to the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for raising up Liz. We thank you for calling her into this position of women's worker in this church. We recognize that she is your appointment, that you have been sovereign over this process. And so we pray, O oh God, that you would continue to strengthen her in the role you have given her Help her as she seeks to encourage and to support and to minister to those to whom you have given her responsibility. Strengthen her in her own walk with you. Keep her close to you, I pray. Help her to be able to minister because she is walking side by side with you. I pray that she would come to know and experience more and more of the Lord Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus, and also come to know your love more deeply. And we pray that you would grant to her wisdom, perseverance, patience, fortitude as she seeks to minister in this church. And in whatever area, whether it be to young mums, whether it be to older women, whether it be to marrieds, whether it be to unbelievers, we ask at all times that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would lead her and direct her. And now as we turn our attention to your word, Speak, O Lord. Your servants are listening. For Jesus' sake. Amen. This was written in 2010 in Australia. So I want you to just think back now. So this is 11 years old. And ask yourself the question, has anything changed? Year 12 girls are more likely to have had sex than boys. And teenagers are likely to have had sex with more partners than a decade ago, a national survey has shown. More than 61%, hear this, 61% of year 12 girls said they had had sex compared to 44% of boys of that year. The study by La Trobe University's Faculty of Health and Sciences research found. In a trend, the report links to heavier drinking by adolescents, 
the proportion of sexually active year 12 girls who reported having sex with three or more partners in the previous year more than doubled to 27% in the decade 2008. Among boys, 38% said they had two or th- uh, three or more sexual partners in that year. The survey of 8,800 year 10 and year 12 students in 300 schools around Australia was taken in three snapshots between 1997 and 2008. The proportion of year 10 boys who had sex rose slightly from 23 to 27 percent between 1997 and 2008. For year 10 girls, the rise was more significant, up from 16 percent to 27 percent. Does that shock you? Does it? Now let's fast forward. This is a survey taken in America. So I understand it's in America, and I understand that we can kind of push it at arm's length and say, yeah, but that's in America. It doesn't apply to us. But the reality is the trends we see happening in America are the same trends we see happening in Australia. Now hear this. According to a new survey by Pew Research, so this is particularly for churches, half of self-identified Christians in America say casual sex is sometimes or always acceptable. Just think about that for a moment. So half of all so-called professing Christians say that casual sex is okay. Uh, Catholics were most likely to take this view, 62%. Though Protestants in the historically tradition, 56%, and mainline Protestants, 54%, were close behind. More than one in three evangelicals. So now we're talking to a narrower band. We're removing Catholics, and we're talking to conservative evangelicals. So like this church, conservative theological evangelical position. 36% hold the same view. So over a third of conservative evangelical Christians say casual sex is okay. Does that shock you? It shocked me when I read it. A majority of self-identified Christians, this this survey has done this year, 57% say sex between unmarried adults in a committed relationship, is sometimes or always acceptable. So now the percentage rises as long as you're in a committed relationship, even though you're not married. That includes 67% of mainline Protestants. Not surprisingly, this is interesting, particularly in view of our numbers tonight, Not surprisingly, frequency of church attendance affects one's perspective on this issue. Isn't that interesting? In other words, what the Pew survey is finding is that those who attend church more consistently have a much higher view of sex than those who don't. A little less than half of U.S. adults who attend services at least once a month, 46%, say sex between unmarried adults in a committed relationship is sometimes or always acceptable, compared with three quarters, 74% of those who attend less often. Did you hear that? So if you attend less often, the percentages are much higher that you consider that kind of relationship acceptable. Now, when I read that, and I read it about two weeks ago, so the Lord knew obviously this was coming around, and it was on one of the Gospel Coalition or another site like that where they quoted these, there was a part of me that was shocked. It's as if our freedom sexually have been so influenced by secular society that the sexual relationship between people 
is no longer sacred. And so Paul, as he deals with this particular problem in Corinth, is not raising for us today a new problem. This is a problem that has plagued God's people throughout history. And so it's very easy for us to think that somehow, because we're living in 2021, this problem is unique to us, but it's not. This is a problem that God's church has grappled with throughout history, and there have been periods in history where it has been worse than others. And the problem in this Corinthian church is they were saying, we're free. We can do whatever we like. God has set us free. And that then spilled over into their relationship sexually. Now, some of you sitting here might think, well, this doesn't really apply to me because I'm, I'm not in that situation. Here goes a sermon that's going to go way over my head because it's not relevant to me. Do you remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ? When he turned and he said, if a man looks at a woman lustfully, he has committed adultery. Nathan and I were talking about, on Tuesday and I'll catch up together, about how Shocked sometimes we find ourselves in going into people's homes and seeing some of the video sets they have bought. For example, Game of Thrones. Now, it's easy to avoid that because it's uncomfortable. But I remember reading, I've never watched Game of Thrones, I remember reading an article in a newspaper saying that People get their pornography kicks from watching Game of Thrones. Now, let me ask you, don't put your hand up. How many of you have watched Game of Thrones? How many of us indulge in watching sexually explicit movies that we justify the end? We say the end justifies the means. There's a good storyline. And so it's not really that critical if there happens to be a bit of nudity or a bit of sex in that movie. The end justifies getting there. And so, you know, it's a good story. It's a good moral. And we invite that into our lives. And Jesus weeps. He weeps. He weeps because you, if you are a Christian here this evening, have to understand you are united with Christ. You are one with Him. He dwells in you. Your body is not your own. There has been a union with Him. And so you don't have ownership over yourself anymore. You are under His ownership and when you allow yourself, and when you allow your eyes to take in those things, you are polluting yourself, and you are polluting Him. And you are bringing shame and dishonor to His name. There's just no other way to say it. There just isn't. And Paul deals with this in the Corinthians context. The limits of freedom. Firstly, True Christian freedom has limits. Verse 12. Verse 12. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. I love the way Paul deals with that. You see in inverted commas in your Bible, everything is per permissible for me. The reason it's inverted commas is because it is taking a saying from the Corinthian society. This was a popular saying that went around. And it went something like this. When I came to Jesus Christ and I handed over my life to Him, and I received spiritual life, my spiritual life took me onto a higher plane. It released me from the law. And it brought me into this new sense of freedom. Now, in some sense, that's right. 
But the problem became is this freedom became all-encompassing. And so now what these Corinthian believers were saying is that I don't have to bring myself under the law anymore. I can do whatever I want because I'm free in the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 5.1, for example. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let, let yourselves again be burdened by a yoke of slavery. Slavery to what? Slavery to the law. So God has, in Christ, freed us from the burden, from the slavery to the law. But now we have been brought under a higher law. A law, says James, that actually gives freedom. Christ's law. So it's not as if we can just throw out the law in its entirety and say, well, nothing applies to us. After all, Jesus repeats nine of the Ten Commandments. And it's not as if those commandments no longer apply because we're now under the covenant of grace. And again, as Nathan and I were chatting, we were talking about the fact that Nathan raised this, and he's right, that we're living in a society that doesn't really battle from legalism. Oh, yeah, there are some pockets of legalism here and there. No doubt, there are some churches that function like that. But our problem is primarily not getting caught up in legalistic kind of living. Our problem is getting caught up in freedom kind of living that says, ah, but God's grace covers everything. Do you see? I, you know, God's grace has, has taken care of all my sin. And, and so, you know, I, when I sin, I can just flee to the cross and I can find grace in the cross. And so it's not that critical that I sin. And the more I sin, the more grace I receive. Does that sound familiar? Is that not the problem that Paul was grappling with with the Roman church? Where the Roman church said, ah, so we've been freed by grace, have we? Well, that's really good news. Because that now means that we can sin more. Because the more we sin, the more we receive grace. And so the more we sin, the more grace is magnified. And Paul answers them and says, are you nuts? Do you not understand what that grace cost? Do you not understand that that meant that Jesus Christ was uh, uh, crucified on that cross and he suffered and died and bore the penalty of your sin? Do you not get it? No, that grace that frees you from the law brings you in subjection to the lordship of Jesus Christ and transforms you into a higher plane of living. Now we live according to Jesus. Now we live according to his character. Now we live according to what pleases him. Now we bring ourselves voluntary under his lordship. And it transforms us. It changes us. It gives us a higher ethic by which we live. Now we don't live according to the former ethics by which we live. Now our morals have been completely transformed. And they're transformed because they're now the morals of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything changes. Romans 6, 1 Let me back up at Galatians 5.13. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Romans 6.1, what then shall we say? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Do you see? It is precisely sin that we have been set free from. We have been delivered and the shackles of sin have been released and broken and smashed. And the power that Satan once had over us and exercised over us, that's Gone. Jesus smashed it on the cross. Now that you've been freed from Satan's clutches, now that you're no longer under his oppression, now that you've become slaves of righteousness, now that you've been made new in Christ, now that you've been made a new person in Jesus, you live in a new way. You live according to who you are in Christ. 
And that must transform how we live. Paul says, everything may be permissible, and he's using that as the slogan, but it's not beneficial. There are things, and here he relates it, as we will see specifically into the sexual realm, where these things are extremely detrimental. And they affect our Christianity and affect our relationship with Christ and do great damage in that relationship. And Paul says, I won't go down that path because I won't be mastered by sin. I'm not going to allow the old tempter to come along and once again place me under slavery so that I jump to his every woman fancy. No, I'm not that anymore. I'm new. I'm in Christ. Now I operate according to who Jesus is. Hallelujah. God has done a work of grace. And so, my dear friends, grace should never be cheapened. It should never be minimized. We should never sin and think that somehow our sinning is okay because God's taken care of it in Christ. Do you hear the cry of Jesus on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you hear the agony of that cry on your behalf if you're a Christian? How then? Can we re-crucify Jesus by nailing him in minimizing our sin? You can't. Secondly, the Christian belongs to Christ. Oh, this is... We could spend a long time here. The Christian belongs to Christ, verses 13 to 17 and verses 19 to 20. Food for the stomach and stomach for the food. Now what's happening is the Corinthians are beginning to try and find a loophole. Paul says it's not beneficial. It's not permissible. But now they're trying to find it. This is another saying. This is another slogan of the Corinthian. Food for the stomach and stomach for the food. But God will destroy them both. Now, if I can just pause there for a moment, there's an element of truth to that. This is the problem. This is how, how often uh, false teachers suck you in. They give you an, a, a, a modicum of truth, and then they add in a little bit of error. And so they pollute the truth with the error. And because you've been sucked into what's true, you don't always identify and recognize the error. And that's what's happening here. Food, food for the stomach, God's going to destroy both. In other words, you know, it doesn't really matter. After all, it's just the body, and the body's going to get destroyed by God, and food's going to get destroyed by God. So it doesn't matter because I'm not really going to get polluted by it. And after all, this body's wasting away any. So how's it going to affect me? It's not important. But God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So Paul takes it up another level. Paul says, yes, but food is different to the sexual realm. Food doesn't affect the entire body in the way that sex does. Food doesn't unite you with another person. Food doesn't cause your relationship with Jesus Christ to be negatively impacted by drawing you into a relationship with another person through the act of sex. That just doesn't happen. And so we're not talking about apples and apples here. We're talking about apples and pears. It's just not the same kind of category that we can put them, lump them together. And Paul says, in effect, yes, well, maybe uh, the body is going to be destroyed, but what you have to understand is God is going to raise the body, and God is going to raise the body to life, and he is going to raise the the body precisely because you have been united. Come, let me keep going on this, uh, with the body of Christ. By his power, verse 14, God raised the Lord from the dead. 
and he will raise us also. In other words, this body is going to be raised from the dead. Yes, it's going to be different to what it is now. Yes, it's going to take on a slightly different form to what it is now. But nevertheless, it's still going to be a body. You will be bodily raised from the dead. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, going back to creation, the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Now what he means by that is that through the power and inner working of the Holy Spirit, when you come to faith in Christ, there is a mystical union that takes place. You are joined to Christ. You become part of the body of Christ. Christ dwells in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so now you have been united to Him. You are one with Him. And the moment you take your body, which is now united to Christ, and you sin sexually, whether that be in premarital sex, whether that be in adultery, whether that be sitting down on your computer and watching pornography, the moment you allow yourself to engage in those kinds of activities, you are taking what belongs to Christ and you are splitting it. You are now giving that body over to that person. There is something unique that occurs in the sexual relationship. And Paul is saying, you need to understand, you belong to Jesus. Don't pollute Jesus Christ by polluting your body, by uniting it in sexual immorality. He picks up this theme in the Old Testament of God's presence dwelling in the temple. And so he says, if I can pick up verses 19 and 20, uh, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit in you, whom you receive from God? If you can just pause there, this is picking up Old Testament temple language. In other words, God dwelt in his temple in the Old Testament through the Spirit. Now, God says, you are his temple, and the Spirit dwells in you, and God dwells in you through his Spirit. You belong to Jesus. This imagery primarily stresses, number one, new ownership. Once you were owned by Satan, once he was your master, Once he pulled the strings. But God has freed you from that. And you have brought yourself willingly under the ownership of of Jesus Christ. You now belong to him. You know when you came to Christ. You said to the Lord Jesus Christ, I submit my life to your lordship. I'm giving myself over to you. Have all that I am. Now that you are under his ownership, you have become his, and you are to behave and to act and to live in a way that is consistent with your master. If a slave in that society did not live in obedience, in faithfulness, and honor his master, they were in big trouble. There were consequences. Jesus is saying, I own you. Live now in a way that honors me. Live in obedience to me. Live in subjection to me. Second, he says the emphasis is Christ has redeemed you. Listen to the language. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, I know God with your body. Now, the price that was paid for your salvation and my salvation, our redemption, is nothing less 
than the sacrifice, the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And Paul is saying, you were bought with the costly blood of Christ. Christ gave everything for you. He did not hold back. He did not say, I'll go to the nth degree and then I'll call it a day. But Jesus Christ willingly suffered pain and shame and dishonor, suffering the penalty for your sin. And through his death on that cross, the precious life of Christ is what has been paid so that you do not have to die in the way that he died so that you might be freed, so that you might come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. What a price. Because when Jesus dies, as I've said so many times from this pulpit, he doesn't die for people who love him. He dies for people who hate him and want to have nothing to do with him, who ultimately put him on that cross. It's a costly sacrifice. Jesus gave everything. There was nothing more to give as the song that was sung before the sermon says. And if Christ has given everything for you, the least that you and I can do is to honor him with the way in which we live. You see, my dear friends, you know this. It's been preached from this pulpit over and over again. You can't claim to be a Christian without evidence of the transforming work of grace in your life. It's impossible. If there's no evidence, there's no conversion. Therefore, the body must be used to honor God and not try and be used to satisfy sexual sin outside of marriage. It's a wonderful little illustration that hopefully will bring this home. Father of a small boy would occasionally sneak into a neighbor's orchard and pluck some of the choicest fruit. He always made sure, however, that the coast was clear. One day, with his son tagging along after him, he carefully looked in every direction, and seeing no one, he crept through the fence. He was just about to help himself when the youngster startled him by crying out, Dad, Dad, you didn't look up. You forgot to see if God is watching. And he is. God is watching. When you watch that explicit movie, Jesus is watching with you. When you engage in that pornography, Jesus is watching with you. When you push the limits of your relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend beyond what Scripture says, Jesus is present. And it may be that some of you need, who are sitting here tonight, to ask and say, Lord, forgive me. I've pushed the limits. I've done things I'm ashamed of. And I need your forgiveness. Thank goodness he is a forgiving God. And then thirdly, the Christian must flee from sexual sin. You must flee from sexual sin. Verse 18. And we're also going to pick up from verse 17b. So let me just, uh, 16b. Uh, do not uh, you unite himself with the prostitute with her as one in body. For it is said the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one in him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. Now, this is so critically important, which is why I read the previous verses that have put it into context. 
all other sins a man commits are outside of his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Now, do you hear what God is saying through the Apostle Paul? All the other sins are in some sense external. This is the only sin that you commit when you sin sexually, where you are sinning against yourself, sinning against your own body. Because the moment you enter into an illicit sexual relationship, what occurs in that relationship is you give over yourself to the other person with whom you engage in that relationship, which means that you unite with her or him and you become one with that person. And when that occurs outside the boundaries of marriage, you have dishonored the Lord Jesus Christ. You have split your union with him in a sense. And you have caused yourself to become a person who is no longer whole. Because when you enter into that sexual relationship, it's not just about a physical sensation. It's not just about physical pleasure. It's not just a joying and having a little bit of fun physically because that's what the world says. It says, what's the big deal about it? After all, it's just two consenting adults having a bit of physical pleasure together. What's the big deal? The big deal is that God has created you sexually to enter into a relationship with only someone you commit yourself to for life in a marriage. And it is in that expression of our sexuality where it is only legitimate to enjoy our sex in that relationship. And anything outside of that breaks what God has created you to do and created you to be. It perverts who you are. It destroys part of you and you lose part of yourself so that whoever it is that you might have slept with has now got part of you that stays with them forever. And you become a split personality. Because sexually, you become one. And when you have a sexual relationship with another one, you become part of you is given away to them too. And sooner or later, when you finally do get married and you enter into a, a sexual relationship, you enter as an unwhole person. You enter as a fractured person. Now, yes, there is forgiveness in Christ. Of course there is. Yes, there is restoration in Christ. Yes, there is, there is a removing of the sin. And there is wholeness in Him. But you can never get rid of the scars. They remain with you for a life. They just do. When a murderer commits murder, and they go to prison, and they get converted, they are forgiven for the murder but they can never bring the person back to life. That person still remains dead. The scar still remains. So yes, God can bring forgiveness. But the consequences that remain never go away. And that's why it becomes so, so critically important, particularly for you young people who have not been married yet, to wait, be patient, ask for God's help and perseverance, ask Him to help you with those sexual hormones that are raging, to remain pure until the day you stand before God in His presence and in the presence of God's people with your bride-to-be and you commit yourself to each other until you die. Don't sin against your own body. It's like stabbing yourself, doing self-harm. Don't deprive yourself of what God has intended you to experience and enjoy in marriage, in the uniting of two people. 
Don't allow yourself in a marriage that perhaps doesn't work out the way that you hoped to cause yourself to look outside of that marriage for sexual fulfillment. Don't allow yourself to get drawn into pornography in a sexless marriage. That's why he says, flee from sexual immorality. Flee, get away. And that is a command. It's in the imperative mood and it is in the present tense. In other words, it's an urgent flee, 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 flee. Do it now. Don't put yourself in a position where sexual temptation becomes overwhelming to the point where you yield. If you know where your weaknesses are, if you know what causes you to fall, if you know where the danger areas are, then don't go and flirt with those danger areas. Don't allow yourself to think that somehow I'm spiritually doing okay this week and so I can handle the temptation. Stay away from it. Get away from it. If that means entering into an accountability relationship with someone, do it. Meet up with them. Say to them, please, Keep me accountable for what I watch. Ask me when we meet together. As we sit down and we work through these issues, ask me, what have I been watching? What have I been allowing my eyes to take in? And rebuke me where necessary and help me and strengthen me because we need those accountable relationships. We need to help each other. We need to get alongside one another. We need to support one another. We need sometimes external help because sometimes when we try and do it all by ourselves, we don't have the strength within to do that. And as much as God gives us grace to resist, sometimes we don't draw on that grace. And sometimes the external accountability relationships just help us in that process. If you have a weakness, don't indulge it. If being alone with your boyfriend or girlfriend is going to tempt you to push the boundaries sexually, don't be alone. Be with friends. If late at night is your problem on the computer, get it passworded so that you can't get in there and let someone else put the password in so that you can't get access. The same for your phone, whatever it might be. But don't just sit back and think it's going to go away. It doesn't. It doesn't. Sexual sin is unique and it's deadly. And we need to run from it for all that we can. We need to get out before we find ourselves simply yielding and having to get on our knees again and say, Lord, I've blown it again. Now, for those of you who are sitting here who have blown it, you know who you are and God knows. What you've done, God has seen. You haven't hidden it from Him. Maybe everyone else, but not Him. He knows. Can I say to you, if you will but confess that sin to him, put it on the table, say, Lord, this is what I've done. Own up to it. Wear it. God will forgive. That's what he does. He forgives. And he will restore. That's what he does. So he doesn't leave us without hope. And for those of you who are married and have been married for a long time and have lived in purity, can I say to you, can I encourage you, get alongside some of our younger people. Tell them how you've maintained your sexual purity. Help them, support them, encourage them. Show them it's possible. Give them tips. Because we're all in this together, unlike COVID. We are in this together. Because we're united in Christ.
And then finally, if you are sitting here and you've never been transformed by God, or you think you're transformed, but as you've heard the sermon tonight, you've realized, hang on a bit, my life isn't anything like it should be in terms of the transformation that should have occurred. And maybe the Lord is saying to you, perhaps you need to consider whether or not you really are saved. Can I encourage you? Come and speak to me. Come and speak to Nathan. Speak to an older Christian. Because Jesus reaches out and offers you to be saved, transformed by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. Lord Jesus, this has been a difficult passage to work through. You created us as sexual beings, but you created that sexual relationship to occur within the confines of marriage and only marriage. And yet when we look at the world around us and we look at the history of the world, we see how often sex has destroyed lives, destroyed families, destroyed relationships, how it has been polluted and perverted. And we recognize that even as Christians, it's so easy to get sucked into the world's way of thinking. And so we pray for much grace. Help us to flee from all forms of sexual immorality. Help us not to allow ourselves to indulge a little bit here and a little bit there. Help us to be ruthlessly committed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Help us to give over every part of ourselves to him that he might have total sway over our beings. Give us the courage to flee where we need to flee. And for those, Lord, who are sitting here that you know who have made and who have committed sin in this area of sexual, in their sexual uh, being, oh God, bring them to the foot of the cross. Humble them. Enable them to come and pour out their heart before you to know that those who confess their sins will be forgiven. And do it for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ and his sake alone. Amen. The singers will sing our final song. Thanks.